Hi, my name is Valentina Drucker. I'm a member of the Cyber Infrastructure Architecture team, and I welcome you to the introduction to Slurm course. As part of the objectives for this course, we're going to take a look at what Slurm is, and then basic Slurm commands, basic module commands, creating and submitting jobs, viewing information on jobs, and finally, requesting resources. Now, Slurm is an open source job scheduler for Linux. It helps give access to resources, for example, access to the compute nodes. It also helps monitor jobs, and also it provides a mechanism that allows us to manage the jobs in a queue. We have basic Slurm commands that come in handy. And this, these commands are um, the commands we use most of the time to manage our jobs. So here we have the sbatch command, which allows you to submit a job for later execution. The srun command allows you to run your job interactively. So the sq command allows you to view information about jobs in the queue. And then the sq or the s cancel command helps you to cancel your job the SACT or the SACCT command allows you to view information about a given job's history. And finally, the SINFO command allows you to view information about the nodes and partitions you have within a high performance computing cluster. So let's take a look at the basic module commands. The first command we have is the module available command, which lists all the available modules and also the module list, which helps you view a list of all currently loaded modules in your environment. And we have the module load and an argument, which is the module name. So for example, this could be module load Python. By doing this, you can load a particular module. You could also unload a module by using the module or load command. The, mod, the module purge command removes all loaded modules. And in order to search for a module, you could use the module spider and then the module name you intend to search for. You could also use the module help command to print um, help for the module. So this gives you um, information about a list of all other options you could use with the module command. So in order to create jobs, there are two important parts of your job script. So the first part is the resource request. And the second part is the job steps. Now with the, re with the resource request, this is the amount of resources that we require for our job to run. And the job steps here, we specify the tasks to be carried out and the software to execute. So before you submit a job for processing, it is important to know what the requirements of your program are so that it can run properly. So for example, we're creating our batch file and next we are making our batch file executable so it can be recognized by the shell um, system. And here we have the content of our batch script. So let's explain the script we have in a previous slide. So at the very first line, you wanna specify the shebang command, which tells the Linux system that this file should be treated as a bash script. And next we have the resource request section that contains the Slurm directives. So this section entails the request of resources like the number of nodes, the number of tasks, the number of CPUs, the time, and the number of um, the amount of memory you require for your job. And the next, the next part of your script are the job steps. Over here, you specify the tasks to be carried out and the software to run. So you can see in the script, we requested one node, one CPU, 100 megabytes, of memory 
And then we want our job to run for 10 minutes. We, this is actually an estimated time. So here, all the job steps that begin with the srun command will execute as one task by one CPU. Now this first job step here will run the Linux echo command and output start process. And the next job step, which is this one, will echo the host name where the job script is being run. And then the next job step will execute the Linux sleep command for 30 seconds. And then the final job step will, will just echo out and process. It is always crucial to set a limit on the total run time of the job allocation. Now this helps the slow manager to handle prioritization and queuing efficiently. Since we are running a very simple script that takes less than a second, it is important to specify the run time limit so that Slurm doesn't see our job as one that requires a lot of time to execute. So in order to submit our job, we use the sbatch command and the name of the, the script file or the, or the batch file. And then we can view information about our queue job by using the sq command and also passing either the job ID or the username flags. Now, for example, if I use the sq command with a dash username, it gives me a list of all the jobs running under my username. And if I use the sq command and the job ID, it gives me the ID of the job I passed as an argument. Now that we ran our job successfully, we also want to check the output because we specify the name of the output file we want our result to go to. So here I've listed um, the files in my client working directory, and you can see we have the output.txt file. Now, if I view the information in this file or the contents of this file, we could see the start process, the, the, the host name where our job ran, and then the final echo statement. Now, what if we have our own program or script to execute? So let's say we have a Python script, a C script, or an R script. How do we run it you know, alongside Slurm? So we're gonna take a look at an example where we'll, we'll create a Python program that accepts an integer as an argument and finds the nearest Fibonacci number to it. And in our bash script, we're gonna allocate one node and one CPU for a wall time of 10 minutes. So this is what our Python script looks like. It accepts an integer argument and then it finds the greatest Fibonacci number, which is close to the value you provided as an argument. And next, we're gonna create our bash script. On the first line, we declared the shebang command, which allows the script to be run as a bash script. And these as bash lines set various parameters for the slum scheduler. And then the next line here allows us to load necessary modules and set in any variables, paths that our program depends on. And then the final statement, which is the S run and the Python command, the script and the Python um, argument. So you can see in this script right here, we are requesting one node, one CPU, 100 MB of memory. And if we set end task to two, this means that our Python program will be executed twice. Now note that the number of tasks requested of Slurm is the number of processes that will be started by the S run. Now, after your script has been submitted and resources are located, S run immediately executes the script on the remote host. It is used to launch the processes. Now, if your program is a parallel MPI program, S run ensures to take care of creating all the MPI processes. If not, S run will run your program as many times as specified by the end tasks option. So for this example, we've set end task 
equal to one because our program is just a simple program that doesn't require any parallel implementation. So our job was successfully submitted and was run successfully. Now, in order to view the results of our job, we use the Linux cat command to show the output of the job, which is in the maxfib.out file. So right here, I use the Linux command cat to show the result of this file. So how do we view um, information on jobs? We can get the statistics or the accounting data on completed jobs by passing either the job ID or username flags. So over here, we used the job ID to show statistics about a completed job. Now, this gives us information such as the partition your job executed on, the account, the number of allocated CPUs, per the job steps, the exit code, and status. So the status could be completed, failed, pending, or running. So we could also use the S control show job ID command to list detailed information for a job. Now this is useful for troubleshooting. You could use the SEF command with a job ID to get a summary of a completed job by the ID. And then you could use um, the SQ command with the job ID or the username ID to list all current jobs for a user. Now we use the S info command to view partition and node information for a system running slur. So right here, when I type the S info command on discovery, it shows the list of all the partitions we have in the discovery cluster. And then it shows you the state of each of these nodes. It shows you the maximum wall time for each of these nodes. And then it, the nodes column tells you the total number of nodes per you know, a given partition. And the state tells you if it's idle, mix or allocated. And this just gives you um, a full description about the, the node, the host name of the nodes. Now, in order to request resources, I always urge HPC users to use the, to visit the, the discovery details page on the HPC website, which displays information about all the nodes and partitions discovery has. Now with this information, you will know the amount of resources a given node has, and it gives you an idea about the amount of resources available for you to run your job. All right, so let's try to understand what the end tasks really does. Now the end task is actually the number of tasks in a job or step. Now this option specifies how many instances of your command are executed. It is very useful if you have independent tasks that you want to run in parallel within the same batch script, or if your program supports, you know, the communication across computers or across CPUs. So right here, we have script one. So we specify the number of tasks, which is one. And right here, we can see we just have one task, which is the S run echo command. Now this executes only once. Now in our script two, we have end tasks set to two. So this actually is gonna execute twice. Why? Because we just have a single um, job step. So based on the fact that this parameter is set to two, this means that the first one is gonna run as the first task and the second one is gonna run as a second task. So this code will be executed twice. All right, so here in our script one, we can see that we have three job steps. And the statistics here shows that the first job 
had to finish before the rest commenced. So the first, the first step finished at 23, 16, 17, after which the second step followed, which is this. And then the third step. Now this means that the job steps were executed sequentially. Now the S run command in this context will run your program as many times as specified by the end tasks. For example, if we set end task equal to two, every command in our job step here would execute twice. So how, how do we use the S run commands and where can it be used? Well, the S run command when used within job scripts executes each job step prefixed with the SRUN command on the compute node. Now, when used interactively, the output will clutter your terminal. So you could use SRUN command within your bash script, or you could just type this on a terminal to run your job interactively. So let's take a look at how we could request resources when running jobs in parallel. So here, you can see that we have three job steps and the statistics we have here shows that all the job steps started executing at the same time. Now this means that the job steps were executed simultaneously. Now, whenever you use SRUN in a submission script, it is used to create job steps. It is also used to launch the processes. Now, if you have a parallel um, MPI program, the SRUN ensures to take care of creating all the MPI processes. Now, prefixing SRUN to your job steps causes the script to be executed on the compute nodes. And here you can see the end flags and the SRUN command, which is similar to the end tasks that we have in the SBatch directive. And also we have the ampersand symbol at the end of every SRUN command. This is used to run commands simultaneously and it removes the blocking feature of the SRUN command, which makes it interactive, but non blocking It is also vital to specify um, the wait command at the very end, whenever you're using the ampersand command. Now, this is because it ensures that a given task does not cancel itself due to the completion of another task. So in other words, without the wait command, task zero would cancel itself, given task one or task two completed successfully. You could also note that the total number of end tasks, the total number of end tasks in the, in the job steps is equivalent to the total number of end tasks specified in the SBATCH directive. So here, the end flag and its value which is one in a serial execution context is used to specify the number of times the given program should be executed. So for example, if we have the SRUN command and we've set the end flag equal to two and then sleep 10 minutes, our output is gonna sleep for 20 minutes because we specify the number of tasks equal to two. So what if you have your script and you would like to run your script in parallel? So let's say your script requires multiple arguments. So instead of creating um, several um, bash scripts, you could you know, create one bash script and specify um, the different arguments that your, your program requires. So over here, I will set the end tasks equal to four, and each of these tasks will use one CPU. And next, I loaded my Python script, and I used the SRUN command to specify the um, to, sp to specify the execution of my Python script based on the number of arguments I would like to pass to it. So I've used the ampersand command and the wait command to ensure that this runs in parallel. So taking a look at our statistics, I would like you to take a close look at the start and the end time of each job step. Now we can tell that 
all the tasks ran independently in parallel because they started at the same time and all finished in less than a second. You would also notice the order in which we specify the job steps is different from the order of the output. So here we have 10, 20, 30, 90. So let's go back to the previous slide to see the order at which we specified uh, the job step. It was actually the converse of it. So this gives us a proof that our job actually executed in parallel. So let's take a look at, you know, going parallel with MPI. So MPI is a standard library that is used to send messages between multiple processes. Now these processes can be located on the same system, you know, which, which could be a single multi-core system or on a collection of distributed servers. We're going to take a quick um, example where we would run a C program that starts three processes. Each of these processes will communicate with each other using the MPI um, API. So this is what an MPI program looks like. So basically this script prints a given process, the machine that um, that process is being executed on, the CPU, the number of CPUs utilized for that process. And then finally it closes um, the MPI call. So given this bash script, in our job steps here, first we compile our C program by using the MPI compiler. And next we use the MPI run command to execute our program. And you can alternatively use the S run command as well. Now over here, you notice the NP flag. Now this specifies the number of MPI processes to run and note that it corresponds to the number of N tasks that we've specified in the SBatch directive. However, if the MP flag is not specified, the end tasks will be the default number of processes to run. So here we can see the output of the script um, we submitted. Now this actually executed three processes and the incremented integer values show the communication between the processes. Now all processes executed on the discovery C6 node and the total number of CPUs used is equal to three. We could also run our code in parallel by using the OpenMP API. Now the OpenMP stands for Open Multiprocessing, which is an add-on to the compiler. OpenMP actually targets shared memory system, that is where processors share the main memory and is based on thread approach. Now the OpenMP launches a single process, which in turn can create, you know, n number of threads as desired. Now, depending on the particular task, it can launch desired number of threads as directed by the user. So basically, OpenMP is a set of compiler hints and function that enable you to run sections of your code in parallel on a shared memory parallel computer. In OpenMP, all threads share memory and data. So this is a C program that implements OpenMP. So here I have my OpenMP um, directive. And next, I'm getting the total number of CPUs calls that are available for OpenMP. And here I'm trying to get the thread ID in the parallel e region. And next, I'm getting the total number of threads available in this parallel region. And next, I'm getting the total number of threads that were requested. And for this if statement, I'm trying to execute this code only on the master thread. So this is what our bash script looks like. Slurm by default doesn't know what calls to assign to what processes it runs. In addition, for threaded applications, you need to make sure that all the calls you request are on the same node. 
So over here, we specified our job name, output, the wall time, which is very important, the number of nodes, the CPUs per task, which actually specifies the number of threads, and then the memory per CPU. So here we're loading our, our OpenMPI module. And here we're compiling our MPI program with the FOpenMP um, flag. So this is required in order for you to compile an OpenMP program. So over here, we have the OMP norm threads, which is an environment variable that is used to specify the default number of threads to use in the parallel regions. Now, by adjusting the value of the OMP number threads, we can adjust the number of execution threads. But here, we set it to the number of threads we want to execute. Now, in our SRAM command, the C option tells Slurm how many threads you intend to run with. So after submitting our job, we got this output. So the master thread section actually shows the total number of available CPUs that we allocated for the OpenMP process. The NPR here shows the total number of threads that we requested. And here we could see um, the thread IDs that uh, we have printed out. So we've come to an end of this tutorial. Just in case you need help or you have concerns, please reach out to us at hpc-team at nmsu.edu and we will make ourselves available to assist you. Thank you for being part of this.